Um, so the next talk is going to be by Noah Berthelsen, and the title of the talk is Toward a 2D Local Implementation of Quantum LDPC Codes. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, so I'm excited to tell you all about our work that we've been doing at Maryland with these uh, co-authors um, toward a 2D local implementation of 2D uh, quantum LDPC codes. We just heard from Chris about a very similar uh, paper. And we are trying to accomplish the same thing, but we, we have some different, different methods um, and it's less asymptotic. So just as, a, as another introduction to LDPC codes, quantum LDPC codes, we're gonna need quantum error correction for large scale quantum uh, computations. Even if we improve our gate fidelities and our device performance, we need to drive down the error rate to do uh, large uh, algorithms. So in the past, the, the choice has usually been the surface code or some topological code like the color code. And this is really nice for certain architectures like superconducting qubits because we can implement their centric extraction circuits in 2D. And for these computers, you can only do gates between uh, qubits that are neighbors on the chip. The issue for this is these topological codes have pretty poor asymptotic parameters and they obey this, this rate distance trade-off. So we have the surface code is really the best choice for this and, the, and it saturates the, this bound. So then as a uh, alternative, these quantum LDBC codes have been introduced and they have way better rate, they have constant rate, and they can achieve distances that are better than the square root of n. And um, in the past few years, they've even found codes where we have constant rate and linear distance. So these are much better performing than the surface code. The drawback for these codes is that if we want to implement them on 2D local architectures, if we want to embed them into these architectures, then the to measure the stabilizer generators, we have to interact qubits that are potentially very far apart on the grid. And for certain architectures, this is not a problem, like neutral atoms or ion traps, because we can just move them around. But again, for superconducting qubits, this is a problem because we have to somehow uh, entangle qubits that are far away just using the 2D local gates. So in our, in our scheme, we also use a bilayer architecture and this has been proposed for a number of QEC uh, projects, uh, including these hyperbolic codes, these concatenated codes that we just saw, and then the, the bivariate bicycle codes, which were, um, which also aim to, to be implemented on superconducting hardware. And just as uh, to define what we're working with, we're gonna have two layers um, where the, the bottom layer contains our, our code of choice or our data qubits and our check qubits. And then we're gonna have a top layer that's just used for extra uh, routing and uh, center extraction. We assume 2D local gates, so we can only perform entangling gates, C-not gates between qubits that are adjacent on the grid. And the two layers can interact between qubits that are um, like, like this under each other. And these are the only really gates that we're gonna allow. And this sort of thing is physically realizable on superconducting architectures. We're gonna focus on that for the talk. And um, it's, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult practically to implement, but it's feasible. So how exactly are we gonna do QVC on the bilayer architecture? We need to measure syndromes, we need to perform logical gates, et cetera, <laughs> everything with the QVC code but we don't really wanna use swap gates to move qubits around. Um, if we don't do some special extra steps like we saw before, we're gonna to incur too much overhead um, because the swap gates incurs a lot of noise and the, the circuits are pretty deep. So instead we can use constant depth gate teleportation. And this was actually used before in this uh, Delphos Beverly Tremblay or Beverly Tremblay paper. Um, However, they found that using constant, get, gate, constant depth gate teleportation 
uh, didn't yield a threshold. And doing this just uh, incurred way too much noise in our, in our uh, air correction scheme. So we introduce a few new improvements to find better results. Uh, and this includes a purification of the bell pairs used in this constant depth gate teleportation. We do apply this partial syndrome QVC. We use different LDPC codes than they use in the paper. And then we provide this generalized routing algorithm for our uh, syndrome extraction. So just as a very explicit example, we have two circuits that measure the X and Z stabilizers of some code. And we see that um, in this basic barren scylla scheme, we need to interact our ancilla qubit which, with each of the data qubits. Um, so if we can move the ancilla around, then it's fine because we can just perform these gates uh, natively. But if we want to do it on this 2D local architecture, say we want to uh, perform a scene out between the blue and the red qubits, then we first have to move the blue qubit into position, perform the CNON gate, and then potentially move it back. And then these, each of these swap operations can be decomposed into three CNOT gates. So we can imagine that um, the, the error that you're gonna accrue throughout this process is, is pretty high. So instead what we can do to potentially save um, some, some time and some error is we first construct this bell pair between qubits on the grid that are that are close to this blue and the red qubit, and then we can just perform gate teleportation to teleport a C knot between them. And just as a as a, a hint, we can make this bell pair in the second layer of our bilayer architecture. And if we can do a bunch of them in parallel, then perhaps we can make it worth our while. Um, so. So yeah, we need to figure out a way of, of constructing all these bell pairs in parallel, essentially. And this process, in general, can be referred to as, as teleportation routing. Um, and as a simple example, suppose we want to measure this, this generator denoted here by the blue qubits. We want to uh, measure them uh, with an ancilla indicated by the red qubit. So we can do this in three steps, essentially, by generating these bell pairs. Uh, well, first by generating a bell pair, performing the C nut, generating the next one, doing this one, and then that, the last one. And so it's, it's pretty simple to just do one. But if we have a bunch of generators, it's less clear uh, on how to do this efficiently. And we can consider the, the depth required to measure some, some generators in this way. And a very simple way of doing this is just to count the number of, or the length of the bell pairs essentially that you need to measure them. So if we have some function f of gamma that is the distribution of the sizes of the generator when we embed them in the grid, we can see that measuring one generator requires uh, one generator size m to the gamma requires m to the gamma and silly qubits, just because if we have a qubit over here and a qubit over here, we have to actually use ancillas, uh, making a path connecting them. So if the path is long, then we need a lot of ancillas. So we can essentially count every path required for all the generators. Um, and since we're assuming we have uh, just a bilayer architecture, we only have a constant number of ancillas and we have essentially m squared um, paths available where m is the size of the size of the grid so if we if we calculate this this essentially gives us a, a circuit depth lower bound on the number of steps it's going to take us to measure some some set of generators in this scheme uh, so yeah here's the explanation of our or lower bounds to the circuit depth where we just have some size distribution where we, we might have a, a lot of small generators and a few big ones, um, but each, each generator is going to take uh, about this many ancillas, some constant. Since we're working with LDPC codes, it's going to be a constant times this. Um, and then we have essentially M squared ancillas available each uh, round to work with. 
so now that we have our, our scheme, we can come up with a simple greedy algorithm to do it for us. And this is essentially, this is the, the easiest thing you can do where we just greedily try to fill up our routing layer with, with uh, bell pairs. And essentially what we do is we go through our list of generators. We start generating bell pairs. We start doing our, our long range C not gates through gate tail portation. And we just keep going through the list of generators until we're done by um, prioritizing generators that are, that are almost done. Um, this scheme, this, this algorithm really only works if our partial generators commute, which is the case if we say only measure the Z type or only measure the X type at a time. So in practice, this seems to perform pretty well. Um, if we, uh, in, this, in this plot, we drew random examples of uh, binary bicycle codes, which we looked at in the paper. And for small code sizes, you know, around 100, 200 qubits, 300 qubits, the theory bound from the previous slide matches pretty well with the, the depth returned by the algorithm. However, we do see if we scale up a little bit, then it starts to deviate, indicating that um, for uh, the, the algorithm is not super optimal. But again, for, for experimental relevant sizes, it could be a, a reasonable choice to do this. So as I said before, this, this teleportation scheme was, was used uh, before to do error correction. However, they didn't find very promising results. And so we added, uh, or we first figured that maybe the, the result of this is that teleporting these C not gates actually uh, increases the error rate of the, the resulting C not gate. So what you can do first is by purifying the bell pairs used in these, in these C not teleportations. And if you do this, then you get higher fidelity C not gauge, gates, which might um, give you enough give you good enough performance to, to see some, uh, see a threshold or see better error correction. And the easiest way to doing this is by generating um, essentially a donor bell pair. Uh, if you have your, your red bell pair that you wanna purify, you make a donor bell pair, and you just perform the circuit. If the measurement results agree on the donor bell pair, then you keep the red one. And if you don't, if they don't agree, then you just toss it. And in the cases where the, the measurement results agree and you keep it, then this, this bell pair has a much higher fidelity. And if you use it in the gate teleportation scheme, then your C not gate has a higher fidelity. So using the previous algorithm, we can do routing, including this, this donor bell pair in much the same way as before, but it complicates it obviously. And I'd like to note that better purification protocols than this exist, but they take longer and use use more qubits and, and bell pairs. Um, so as I mentioned before, we use these bivariate bicycle codes, which were recently introduced, and they come from this wider family of generalized bicycle codes. The, the construction doesn't really matter too much, but what does matter for us is that they have this repeated parity check structure and they have a few number or the small percentage of generators that are large. And what I mean by large is that they cross this, uh, this, this long boundary um, for specific embeddings. Um, and this repeated parity check structure is uh, essentially a translational symmetry of the checks. And this just allows us to manually create routing schedules that are fairly optimal. Um, and as an example, of these, these short and long range generators. Here's a, here's a BB code and I have highlighted a short range generator versus a long range generator. And if we do our, our routing scheme, our gate teleportation scheme, then we can see that doing this generator is gonna take a much longer bell pair because we actually have to stretch all the way down here compared to just doing this one, which, which requires smaller, um, smaller bell or shorter bell pairs. Um, and here's an example of uh, a routing schedule that we found by hand for another BB code for the short range generator. So any of the ones that don't cross the boundary. And I have included the, 
the pink donor bell pairs that we need to do the purification. Um, and it, uh, we can see that we can do this in, in five steps, essentially. Uh, the circuit depth actually is about 10 times longer than this because we have to do the, the bell pair generation, the purification, and then the implementation of the CNOT gate. And if we were to do the long range generators, then it would also add more uh, routing rounds. So the, the drawback, the main drawback for the scheme is that the, the center extraction circuits are pretty deep. So it only works in some error regimes. So to help with, with uh, error correction, we also do this, this partial syndrome QEC. Um, and this is formalized by this masking idea which is the process of removing generators from the stabilizer group during some QEC rounds. And I have removing in, in quotes because we're not actually removing it from the, the stabilizer group. We're just neglecting to measure them in some rounds. Um, so the purpose for this is we saw that there's few long range generators, but since they're uh, requiring more or longer CNOTs, they're gonna take essentially longer to measure. So instead, what we can do is we can measure these long range generators less frequently and still hope to uh, hope to achieve similar logical error rates as if we were to measure all of them. Um, so we can potentially decrease the circuit depth, which yields fewer idle error locations and then a lower effective error rate. Um, so for example, you know, if we, we have some error correcting code and we measure the long range generators every 10 rounds, then the circuit we get is about 35% shorter than if we were to measure every generator every time. So there's could be some significant savings in circuit depth. Okay, so we've we've done all the building blocks and we're gonna put them all together into circuit level simulations to see how this performs. Um, so we know how long it takes to route, purify, and measure the generators for specific code embedding. So we know how long or how much idling error to apply. We also know how many long range generators there are. Based on our purification scheme, we also know how well the purification performs. So we know what the resulting error rate of the CNOT gate is. And then we also know how often the purification fails. So we know when the, the, the short range generator or all the generators should be available. I should note that in our scheme, um, if a purification fails, then we kind of just neglect, we just give up on the generator uh, instead of retrying it. So this, this adds into this partial error correction scheme and it turns out that the performance doesn't suffer too much. Uh, to, to decode, we do this circuit level decoding, which is then um, used in a, a large number of recent QC papers as shown to be pretty well performing. Um, but just in general, we we build this circuit level bipartite graph, which we can use to correct errors. And this bipartite graph essentially has check nodes, which are the um, called detectors, this parity of time adjacent syndromes. And then we have bit nodes, which are the errors in the circuit. And then we connect these, these check nodes and bit nodes if an error is detected by this detector. The novelty for this work is that um, with the partial syndrome QEC, we might have to look a few rounds back to, to get the syndrome difference. But practically, in, um, it doesn't really change much how it performs or how it, how it functions. So for the circuit level simulations, we compare it against the surface code and we, uh, we extract the, the logical error rate per round to quantify how well it performs. I'd like to note on this slide, um, this panel right here, panel C, we changed the rounds at which the long range generators are measured. Instead of uh, everything, every one round, we do every five rounds. And we find, at least for this code and this, this error regime, um, they, they perform pretty well. So presumably masking has minimal effect on the logical error rate. Now, if we plot the logical error rate versus the, the total space overhead that we use in the scheme, we can see that these BB codes implemented uh, are outperformed by surface codes at small enough sizes. However, if we scale up, eventually we start to see better, uh, better performance out of them than the surface codes. And if we scale up the, the number of logical qubits to 12, then 
they immediately start performing better. And um, like I said before, our, the main drawback for the scheme is the long circuit depth. So if we have error rate that is, is lower, or in this case, no idle error rate, then we see way better performance out of the DB codes than the surface codes. So in conclusion, we have introduced a physically realizable 2D local architecture for implementing non-local quantum LDPC codes. Um, we've developed bounds and a greedy algorithm for performing syndrome extraction circuit using LOCC routing, gate teleportation, and tailwind purification. And then with numerical simulations, circuit level simulations, we showed that bivariate bicycle codes implemented in the scheme have, have comparable performance to surface codes, but they use fewer qubits. I should note that the scheme is, is general in the sense that if you have a different code, if you have a you know hypergraph product code or whatever, you can apply it in the scheme as long as it has a, you know an embedding that you want to use that is yeah has a a, a nice embedding. Um, however, as I said, this is probably only viable in certain error regimes, or if you can isolate the qubits, the data qubits, while we're doing this this uh, bell pair generation and stuff in the in the routing layer. So it's. It remains to be seen if this is uh, like where we can use this or in what devices. And with that, I'll, I'll end and take questions. Um, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I'm wondering how did you um, how did you decide uh, which uh, the criteria of the long range in your uh, change of the syndromes and um, I'm also wondering how do you change your decoding when you remove some of the syndromes? Yeah. So the um, the these BB codes they have. Uh, nice embeddings actually. Um, they have like a, a torque, they call it a torque layout where they have four short range and two long range um, qubits and then each check. And you can go through each code and it has a number of, of different embeddings. And if you choose codes where the, um, where the, the grid that it's embedded on is like skinny and tall, then you get a few number of these long range checks and then a lot of these short range checks. So mainly we looked at codes where this is the case and then it's it's only the, the checks that like cross this boundary, like cross the long range boundary. We consider those the, the long range checks. So it's always like deterministic based on the embedding. Yeah, the decoding um, is, is really simple. There's not, it's not really changed at all. Um, so like when you, uh, there's supposed to be a syndrome here, right? But there isn't. So then when you get this syndrome, if you're gonna find the, the detector, which is the, the notation for this, which is just the parity of the current syndrome and the previous one, you just look from this syndrome back to this one. And then this detector forms, um, like a node in the graph. And essentially all this comes down to is that there's gonna be more errors in here that are associated with this guy. Whereas, you know, up here, it's gonna be split over these two detectors essentially. Any more questions? Hey, um, yeah, thanks for the talk. This is really cool. Um, if you, uh, I, I guess, yeah, you had these long range stabilizers that uh, were kind of not over the boundary. And then you had the ones that were really long because they're over the boundary. If you got rid of the really long ones by like maybe uh, having some other way of connecting the top to the bottom boundary with do you think that would make like a huge difference or only a little difference? 
Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So I think um, you, I think you lose a lot for these codes at least if you didn't consider them on a torque layout. If you just considered like a planar, a planar one in which you'd lose these. I guess, sorry, I guess I was thinking like, let's say you could create a entangled pair of photons and then interact them at the boundary and like do the long, the super long ones in a completely different way and only do the this teleportation thing for the medium size ones. Yeah, that would that would actually work great because um, for for like the comparison between the time it takes to do a bunch of these uh, short range ones versus a few of these long range ones, they're like almost comparable. So it takes like just as long to measure these 15 checks as it does to measure these like 40 checks. So if you could cut down on this, uh, you know, the, the overwhelming fraction of the time that it takes to measure these very few checks, then yeah, yeah I think you'd expect to see some, some benefits. Thanks. Got one simple question. Maybe I missed it, but do you get a threshold with your scheme? Um, so yeah, we don't do an asymptotic sort of calculation, but we experimentally see that increasing the block length decreases their rate. And this is, um, you know, in comparison to the 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 Delphos Beverland Tremblay paper, where they don't see any increase, they actually mm -hmm. see the the error, the logical error rate go up if you increase the block length. Well, do Do you believe that you could like theoretically derive a threshold by this like purification idea? Yeah, yeah, I think there's if you if you consider the yeah the asymptotic scaling of the the purification scheme and then the um, uh, maybe a more rigorously defined routing schedule than perhaps you could. Any other questions? All right, so let's thank the speaker again.